Um, thank you for joining us on the replay of this webinar, which was brought to you by the IET Surrey volunteers and took place on the 17th of February 2021. In the talk that you'll hear in a few moments, our speaker, Dr. John Moyle, will transport us on a journey to the far southwest of England and tell us about Cornwall's communication heritage. Now, John's got an interesting background. He left secondary school with four GCSE ordinary levels and a strong Cornish ancestry. He ended up as a chartered engineer with the Institute of Measurement and Control and a consultant in anaesthesia and intensive care at Milton Keynes University Hospital. So on retirement, he returned to his engineering roots and completed a PhD on the maintenance of Victorian submarine telegraph systems which he says qualifies him as an elderly anorak, they're his words and not mine. I'm sure we'll hear more about John's career journey in his talk about Cornwall's communication heritage. So well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Um, I'm afraid I haven't got a Cornish accent. Uh, my father came up from Cornwall um, a good many years ago. Um, the, this map is quite interesting that's on, on the screen at the moment. Um, if you notice, uh, the writing is all horizontal. And I found out recently why that was. It was terribly expensive in those days uh, to produce uh, maps um, in the landscape mode. Everything was done um, in portrait mode. But um, I keep using that map and I may mainly be talking about an area around here as well as the rest of Cornwall. Uh, a, str a very strange background, which I think I better tell you about. Um, I, it was four O levels um, that I got at about the 20th attempt. I was a dunce. I ended up um, doing a student apprenticeship uh, with the Mullard Radio Valve Company, which is part of the Phillips Group. And some people might have recognized uh, the F86 here. Um, I put that there because um, in those days, uh, when I was doing my apprenticeship, it was valves and transistors. Um, integrated circuits came in later on. At the last year of my apprenticeship, I was allowed to uh, do in whatever branch of um, the company organization I would like to join. The only jobs available were Phillips Medical, uh, which <coughs> was in Balham, gateway to the south, um, which and why I only took it because it, I also could live, still live at home because I couldn't stand the sound of blood. Um, however, I got on quite well with them um, and found that blood wasn't too bad when everything was under control. Um, and, but they wanted to turn me into a manager or got put on a management um, stream. And this um, I rejected uh, because um, I wanted to stay practical. So uh, I ended up uh, going to Barts Hospital Medical School in London um, and then pro progressed at postgraduate to anaesthesia and intensive care. I'm told that I shouldn't have been an anaesthetist because as you can see, uh, the anaesthetist is here. Um, I can't do crosswords, uh, but I still made out quite well as an anaesthetist and in intensive care until I retired. Um, and. But uh, just before I uh, mention what happened uh, next and what we're going to go on to, just to prove that I'm Cornish, uh, Moyle, and I'm singular, my, um, my wife is very glad there's only one of me. Uh, I always get an S added to my name recently, but still it's something to do with Radio 1, I think. Um, it's, I, I, in the Cornish language, it means either bald, bear, or a mule, and I'm not too enamored with any of those. Uh, so I think it's best if we carry on uh, with the subject in hand. <clears throat> Interestingly, Cornwall uh, had the complete range of communications um, systems which were either tried out there or are still there. The main reason being, of course, uh, that it was the furthest southwest that you could get, not the furthest south, that's the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall, but um, a lot of this stuff was beyond that, uh, down at uh, the far end of Cornwall. And it forms a complete circle from optical uh, through copper, through wireless or radio, 
um, and the little bypass up to satellites for a while, um, uh, as far as Cornwall's concerned, and uh, then back to optical again in the form of fiber optics. So starting with the very basic stuff um, before the high technology, um, visual communications, uh, the fire beacon was the one which is uh, was most often talked about. It was originally set up to warn of the Spanish Armada. Um, and uh, they still, the fire beacons are still there and the sun have been added later. And they're used on special occasions, centenaries and things like that. Next uh, came uh, what well, the Hewer, H-U-E-R. Um, now what he was, um, was he would stand on a cliff top. They even gave him a nice little uh, hut uh, made out of stone. I uh, can't remember where this one actually, where I took this photograph. Um, but the hewer uh, gave semaphore type signals, usually with brushes uh, made of reeds. And what he was doing was he was watching where the fish were, where the pilchers were, and signaling to the ships, uh, to the fishing vessels um, out, in the, out in the sea, where he could see where the shoals were. A little later on, um, uh, this sort of this system of uh, telegraph, uh, semaphore telegraph, was used. Um, it originated in France by a bloke called Chappé, um, and the cross beam was about ten feet in, uh, across. And the, this was mainly set up for uh, signalling from the Admiralty uh, down to the various ports along the south. Um, <coughs> It definitely got as far as Plymouth um, and is pro was probably connected on further down to Falmouth. Uh, a later system uh, which was used um, that was, uh, was also set up by the Admiralty um, and you can see from this chart which I believe cost three shillings at the time it says at the bottom. Um, the only snag with these semaphore systems of course is that um, when it was foggy um, you couldn't see them. And the weather down in Cornwall can be very, very variable. Moving to um, things more probably more interesting, uh, landline telegraphy, which was um, in this country, the Wheatstone system of uh, five needles was where it started, uh, but it very soon ended up with the American fashion uh, using Morse code uh, and it always referred to as landline telegraphy rather than cable telegraphy which was uh, the submarine cables. Now the landline uh, telegraphy um, used mainly a straight key, an ordinary Morse code key, although um, mechanical bugs were used later on which was semi-automatic. Um, the conductor was copper to start with, copper wire, um, but this was forever being stolen because it was very useful for making jewellery out of. And so quite often at the inland, uh, certainly the short distance telegraphy was using iron wire instead. Insulation was air or porcelain, cotton, rubber or enamel. Now the initially, um, we all think of uh, Morse code as being dars and dits. Um, well, it, they, they use this thing called the sounder and that is a sounder which I'm in the top right hand corner there uh, which I'm actually operating with my finger and it must have been very difficult because for example an A uh, which is a dot and a dash was it's very how they did it um, and understood the code um, just from that click clicking noise up to 70 words a minute was quite incredible uh, they also used um, a thing called the Morse Inca, which we'll come to a bit later on uh, when it was used um, by Marconi as well. Um, but as you can see, it's a clockwork driven um, paper tape um, with the same uh, device at the end operating a pen. Now that different from uh, submarine cable telegraphy in a, in a great number of ways. Um, the maintenance of the early telegraph, um, inland telegraph system, um, the maintenance was with a crude galvanometer or quite often the tongue actually licking the um, conductor to see if you could detect the electricity coming down it. 
um, but uh, they suddenly had, a, there was a big change, changing to submarine cable telegraphy, uh, where things had were very much more sensitive, much less crude, uh, much more scientific. Um, they, they used a thing called a cable key, which you can see on the left there, which is, uh, in fact, two separate Morse keys, uh, one for a dot and one for a dash. Uh, the conductor was always copper and the return uh, was by seawater brine. Um, the insulation, um, it, oh, they also had to wait until they could get hold of gutta persia, uh, which I'll show you a slide of in a moment. <clears throat> and the key uh, was called a cable key. Initially, um, they used uh, what uh, Kelvin called, uh, Professor uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, Professor Thompson called a mirror speaking galvanometer. Um, the, the galvanometer itself is on the right and on the left at the top there is the, uh, the underneath um, is the light being shined, the shone uh, into this little hole here to the mirror that's in there back across the scale here. And it was very difficult to, um, to, to read as I, I'll show you in a moment. And very soon, uh, they, uh, Lord Kelvin um, designed this thing, um, the self, uh, siphon recorder, which is probably the earliest inkjet printer. Uh, well, it was the earliest inkjet printer. Um, and I'll show you how that works in a moment or two. <clears throat> this gutta persia um, was an interesting material. It, it had some uh, similarities to rubber, but some much better properties for as an insulation. Um, and it came from trees um, in this area around here, Burma, Borneo area, and only in that area of the world. And they made a lot of money out of it. Uh, it could be collected in the same way as the rubber was collected from rubber trees, but sadly, um, instead, most of the time, uh, they chopped the tree down and got the uh, Persia out of it uh, that way. Um, we needed, Britain led the world, really did lead the world for once in uh, something technological. Uh, it was the first of the major technological uses of electricity, real uses of electricity. Um, but uh, the people who sold the gas of Persia uh, to them um, saw that they were wanting vast quantities of it. And so, and it was, they sold it by weight. Um, and very soon uh, there was more wood and stones in the gutta Persia when it was being delivered back to England um, than there was gutta Persia. So they, there were a lot of purifying had to go on to uh, <coughs> get it to, into a cable, uh, useful for cables. Um, the only other thing it's used for at the moment is actually temporary fillings in the tooth. Um, it's an interesting material. It's hard, it has a hard plasticity. It's, it's very hard when the temperature is below 100 Fahrenheit, but becomes very plastic above 150 Fahrenheit. It's an extremely good um, electrical insulating uh, resistivity from a resistivity point of view. And the strangely, it's the it gets better and better the more pressure it's put under deeper in the ocean. And it's got an extremely low uh, coefficient of thermal contraction and expansion. <clears throat> now, the cable itself, um, this was the, how cables were up until about the 1930s. Uh, but they started initially uh, just being a copper conductor surrounded by gutta persia. And these other layers uh, very soon um, became the absolute necessity. And you might wonder why the brass tape is there. It was pr to protect the gutta persia, uh, which is a very delectable morse morsel to a lot of cable boring animals. And I'll point now, show you a picture of one later. Initially, the uh, the cables uh, were laid were just uh, copper and a copper core and the gutta persia insulation. Um, <clears throat> before it. Uh, Got really got things got going in Cornwall, um, which became the real cable centre of the country. Um, the first, the, his, the basic history was that David Calais Cable um, was a complete failure in, 90, in 1850, um, and a French fisherman uh, 
pulled up a bit, chopped it up, put, took it down the pub somewhere in France because he thought he found an animal with gold down the middle of it. Um, but he was sadly, um, it was not true. <laughs> 1851, South Sanget, it was a success. And then lots and lots of cables um, between the UK and um, mainland Europe. Um, the major ones being Deverest End, Orphanist to Shavingham. Um, they were all successful. Then they wanted to go further and tried um, to cross the Atlantic. And in 1855, it was a complete failure. Um, it was two sailing ships that um, did it, um, and it, it was no good. Surprisingly, the very, a year later, they managed to raise enough money on both sides of the Atlantic to have another go. Um, and a cable was laid in 1856, but it was very short-lived. Um, and it didn't involve Cornwall, it's just, uh, how, just to show you the, the background story, really. Um, these Atlantic cables actually went to Valencia um, in southwest Ireland, uh, because obviously it was a short route. So then there was um, the, the great thing that the uh, British government wanted to do was to communicate with the jewel in the empire, uh, that being India. And um, they could do some of this cross land, but a lot of it needed to go by sea because um, if you didn't go via places that were friendly, um, they would either chop the cable for you going across Europe and wherever, um, or they would spy on it and copy it down what was said. <clears throat> so they tried to keep as much of it at sea as possible. But the Red Sea was, um, was a complete failure, a very, very expensive failure for uh, <clears throat> the government um, because they said, whatever happened, we will pay you the money for the next 10 years. Um, and it's no good writing a contract like that. Uh, <laughs> Um, when it's a private company, uh, because um, the, one of the key things you have to do when laying this cable under the sea is leave lots of slack, like 20% extra slack cable um, to, to be able, so that you could lift it up and um, so that it would conform with the base of the, the, um, the, the ocean, the seabed, um, and also that you could lift it up to repair it if necessary. And the Red Sea cable, um, the surveying wasn't that brilliant, uh, as it none of it was. It was just lowering down weights and pulling them up again. Uh, if you left it wide apart, of course, you had no ride, real idea of what the surface was like um, under uh, under the water. Uh, the snag was that the Red Sea is full of mountains, and to save money. Um, they led the cable like a catenary across the, the tops of a series of mountains down the Red Sea, and it was a complete failure. Um, <clears throat> repeatedly, they had to try and repair it, but the poor old government, even though it didn't work, um, had to fork out for the next 10 years. The, the story might cease there, but for the fact that um, they formed a committee of inquiry, the Board of Trade did, um, in England um, to, to find out whether or not uh, this was a viable technological thing to do and whether it was biological from a, a biological, it was a possible from a financial point of view. They set up the inquiry and the inquiry found that the ideas of the cable and the finance of the cable were all very straightforward and sensible but they just got to be a lot more accurate in what they were doing and a lot more careful. And of course, one of the problems was, uh, one of the major problems was that up until then, copper had only been used um, in the form of wire <coughs> for decorative purposes and jewelry. Um, and suddenly um, the manufacturers of the copper wire, which were mainly in the Midlands, um, had to, for reasons they had no idea about, um, had to make sure that the diameter of the copper and the purity of the copper was was good all the way along. And it, that once they got the whole hang of that, things improved. At the same time, the uh, British Association for the um, Advancement of Science um, had a series of committee meetings to formulate uh, electrical standards and electrical units. Um, I haven't got time to go into that, but there were dozens of standards of electrical resistance. 
Um, but uh, that, that was um, a long story. However, in, by, by the end of the committee inquiry and the improvement in the uh, manufacture of the copper wire, the first Atlantic cables laid it, that worked was laid in 1865. And the trouble was um, they ran out of cable uh, a lot of halfway through it. Somehow, again, they got, uh, managed to get some money um, and they used steamships in this time um, instead of sailing ships. And in 1866, it was not only successful Atlantic cable, um, but um, also they managed to find the end of the year, last year's of the previous year's cable and extend it to, across the, the Atlantic altogether. Now, when you start laying these cables, uh, as opposed to uh, just those that connected um, the British Isles to the to the continent, um, when you're going much further distances, the problems got bigger and bigger. A typical cable um, would be two thousand uh, nautical miles. Um, it might be between two and three thousand arms, um, and it, it would have a huge capacity. Uh, electrical capacity. There are also problems in um, the sensitivity of the receiving apparatus, um, also problems with getting the signals to go in both directions uh, at the same time and, and balancing the cable so that they would do that. There were interfering currents the whole time. Um, on the bigger, the longer the cables, the worse they were. There were earth currents, uh, due to changes in um, the Earth's magnetic field, and some of those were diurnal, uh, others were much longer cycles. Um, you could have magnetic storms, um, also the new electric railway systems, which were high current, would set up um, um, electromagnetic fields um, near the coast. Um, and then uh, in the end, there were the problems of wireless systems um, up interfering as well. Now, Lord Kelvin, um, uh, Professor Thompson, um, he described um, the arrival curves, which show the delay that were caused by sig of signals uh, going uh, at long distances under seawater uh, because of the huge capacitive effect. And as you can see, um, the, the, the roughly there was about 10 ohms per nautical mile, the resistance of the cable itself, and about 0.35 microfarads per nautical mile, uh, the capacitance uh, between um, the cable core and the, the seawater. And Lord Kelvin, although his, his arrival curves, as he put them, were much more complicated. For, fortunately, a chap called Frank Scowan um, reinterpreted them. Now, if you look at the graph at the bottom, um, this is uh, this this wire, it's time along the bottom here, and uh, voltage here. This is the voltage applied as from here. Oops. Um, and you can see that as you um, when you switch on the supply, it rises rises exponentially up. And when you then earth it again, it comes down exponentially. But as you see here, for at naut with this scale for um, naut for 100 nautical miles, that's five milliseconds. That would be sort of no, um, uh, the North Sea ish. Um, if you're talking about the Atlantic, it would be roughly 2,000 nautical miles. That would be two whole seconds. And uh, th that would be equivalent to a uh, cable going across uh, the Pacific. It would be six seconds. So if you're thinking of using ordinary Morse code, it would be extremely slow. So they didn't use Morse code. Morse code uh, is on the, the top of this graph here, um, where you have where a dot um, and a dash would be, they're both the same polarity with the space in between, and the dash was three times the dot in its length. Okay, so that's an A there, which is a dot and a dash, and a B, which is a dash and three dots. So, but in, because that would just come out as a continuous um, positive voltage, 
um, they had to uh, uh, over a long distance um, they ch changed it to being all the elements were the same length but there, it was a positive voltage that was applied for a dot and a negative voltage that was applied for a dash and depending on how the di the distance of uh, the cable, the length of the cable, the time was the time here. So the longer cables had to have a longer time, and the shorter cables a shorter time. The sim the basic circuit that was used um, was um, they used it as slightly different symbols. It's they, some of them will get worse, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, but the 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 key, the, the cable key, um, there was one um, part, one side of it was for a dot and one side of it was for a dash and that they would send, it would just change the polarity basically of the signal. The um, When it was going to be sent, um, it would go come around here, the current around there and the submarine cable across the, across the ocean, the return um, the earth return would be via the brine and it, when this is switched to the rec its receiving mode at the other end of the cable uh, it would go through the galvanometer here and this was the shunt uh, for the galvanometer and initially um, it was extremely slow we're talking about sort of two words a minute at the most across the north atlantic um, which, which is extremely slow and the snag was the they had had two highly skilled people reading at the receiving station um, watching this dot uh, moving backwards and forwards on the mirror galvanometer very slowly and also it would drift um, because of the currents that i mentioned the earth currents and other currents um, and that was improved slightly by um, in putting in these uh, capacitors here although I'll refer to them as condensers because that's what they were called at the time, of course. So the, this, it was a fairly simple, straightforward circuit. Um, the voltages used were between 50 and 120, 120 being over the, 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 the longest cables. Um, they, they did use other um, testing voltages um, but there's the, the well-known one of the um, uh, one of the one of the first cables from the North Atlantic was destroyed by an amateur electrician come surgeon he was both I suppose that's a bit like me really um, uh, who blasted when he when the cable didn't work he blasted it with um, 2,000 volts from an induction coil and that really made sure that the installation was totally destroyed now, depending on the length of the cable, this would be the signal that would come would be um, that would be visible. An L is a dot coming up here, followed by a dash, followed by two dots. Now, if it was a very short cable, um, it would you clearly see the two dots and clearly see the first dot and the the big dash. Uh, medium length cable is the one marked B, which you can see is much more getting much more smoothed out. And along the longest cables, for example, crossing the main nations, th this, this was the equivalent of a dot. And this was the equivalent of two dots. It became extremely difficult. Um, if you look at the figure five, which is just five dots in a row, um, this you can see here, this is a short cable, medium cable, and then the long cable, they're all getting smoothed out. You had to be extremely extremely skilled to uh, read the code from there. It took one operator reading it and, the, and another operator with immense concentration writing it down. Initially, they laid the cables, the um, long distance cables going towards um, Gibraltar, uh, the Mediterranean and off, uh, off to India were laid from Falmouth, uh, but very soon uh, they gave up the idea of running the cables, submarine cables from Falmouth because they got destroyed, um, it being a major uh, naval port apart from anything else and the cables just being ripped up left, right and centre. And that's why they moved to this beautiful um, valley um, about 10, 12 miles west 
um, of uh, Falmouth <coughs> um, and laid the cables here because it, there were, it was a very shallow beach, which is ideal for letting the cables in and nobody wanted to park their ships or drag their ships around there. Um, so it just ended up in this beautiful quiet valley and it ended up as having the largest cable station in the world. Uh, this is just another view from actually that's the road that goes up to the Minak Theatre and the cable station will be over here. Uh, that's what the beach looks like now. Um, the photograph you saw earlier um, before I started talking was a summer's day <laughs> because this beach gets so crowded um, in the summer. If there's a storm, um, uh, then a lot of the cables, there were 27 working cables coming out of here uh, towards the end of the Second World War, um, and still they reappear if there's a good storm. Um, this is the, the cable hut is here, which is where the cables come up to um, as uh, big, uh, as the big submarine cables come into the hut and then um, into the hut here and then with ordinary landline cables go up to the cable station, which is up there. Um, this view, if anybody's been down there, this view is taken from the Minac Theatre. Uh, which is an outdoor theatre there, which is, is rather good fun, except when the weather's bad. This is looking up the valley, and this is the cable station here, uh, which was built in 1870. And behind here, this is all granite here. Um, and these buildings were all built around the time uh, as the cable station uh, grew uh, to, to house the staff, because this was about what, seven or eight miles from Penzance of very narrow roads at the time. And this is the road that goes up to the Minac Theatre here. The technology, as I've mentioned, is mirror galvanometer, anything from two to about seven words per minute. The, the condensers or capacitors improved it a bit, but then it became so difficult um, to get staff uh, who would sit for hours on end uh, reading a mirror galvanometer that um, Kelvin, or Lord, Thompson, uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, Professor Thompson, um, developed this thing called the siphon recorder. Um, and this is one of the original ones actually at uh, Porth Kerner in the, the museum there. The cable station uh, became a museum in about um, the, in the 70s. Um, in 1970. It was open for about a uh, hundred years. Um, and you can see here the paper tape coming through here um, and in here there's a huge powerful magnet. Now this, these things had to be extremely sensitive so they were trying to get, because we're, we're only talking about currents of a few milliamps, um, if it was a transatlantic cable or a long distance cable down to Gibraltar and onto uh, on through that way to India. Um, so what we have here is a huge, powerful magnet, permanent magnet. The cable line comes in here and there's a very fine coil, very fine coil of wire here. And that's the other end of the cable line coming in. And this coil here is suspended by a cotton thread and two, two threads, or little weights here to keep it central. Now the object of the exercise was to remove all friction, which of course would make the thing far less sensitive. Uh, so what happened here was that this little thread here was attached to the coil and it, this bit here is a, a tub, uh, an ebonite tub of ink, black ink. And this is a capillary tube coming down here and not touching the paper. And it pivots through this line here. And this of course then wiggles um, as the current changes because of this piece of thread pulling it. Now this bit up here um, was called the Morse motor, MM, that had to be called the Morse motor. Um, and this, this was an electric generator of static electricity, which was passed down through here, through this insulator, into the ink. The other, this complete, the circuit was completed 
well, not quite really because it was static electricity and the pen wasn't quite touching the paper. Behind the paper was a little metal plate and that completed a circuit to here. So here, therefore, we have the, any tiny current along there would wiggle this and the voltage, the static electricity would draw the ink towards the paper, the paper here. So there was absolutely no, in inverted commas, friction between a pen and paper. Very clever. First inkjet, print, uh, inkjet printer in the world. And this is how it would print out, that it would draw out the trace. Um, as you can see, there's an A there, and there's a B here, which is a dash and three dots. Um, and this, of course, just needed a technician to make sure it was running all the time. And you could have clerks, um, batteries of clerks, um, who could translate these um, into the messages to, to send on. And this more than doubled the speed of the, the cables. In 1879, to speed things up even further, they decided to try um, the duplex systems. In other words, that you could send a, a message at the same time in both directions. Uh, a method that was often used in landline telegraphy involved a, gal a galvanometer, which had two coils. Um, so, and uh, you could get a balance between the two. The key thing was that the, this was the signal line here, and the, the other thing you needed here, which is a, looks like a coil, that's because it, this book was, comes out of a book written by Charlie Bright in 1896. Uh, but the, the important thing was this resistance here had to exactly be the same as the resistance of the line. To make it work for cable telegraphy, which required much more sensitive uh, instruments, um, they used a bridge system, a Wheatstone bridge system. Again, these, the resistance is here, and the one here with the capital R um, is the uh, equivalent of, uh, of the cable um, between the two stations here, here and the one at the other end. And this had to be exactly the same in capacity and um, in resistance as um, the line was. Otherwise, it, you wouldn't get a, a good, you, you could still uh, see signal interactions. And the, the, to make these artificial lines, as they were called, um, they were much more complicated than just the simple drawing that was there. Um, I, I can't go into how it actually works um, now because it would take an hour or so just to describe uh, just to describe it but it was a very important uh, piece of equipment to because uh, it doubled the line speed at the speed of the the submarine cable um, and those the artificial lines were made up with these boxes um, which contained uh, the resistance and capacitors and you that you probably for say a cable going across the Atlantic um, there would be six or seven of these boxes and you had to mix and match them uh, till you made a cable which was exactly the same, uh, an artificial cable which was exactly the same properties, electrical properties as the, the submarine cable. Just um, a little uh, sideline really is that there were, after the teething problems, um, that there are many, many cable histories. Um, I've got about 20 volumes of cable histories here, um, but all of them just mention a few teething problems um, and the cables would last about 50 to 70 years afterwards. Um, but um, they only looked reliable uh, because of the duplicate cables that were there and rerouting of signals, um, maybe by going through other completely different routes. There was a lot of commercial secrecy around, um, which hid most of what was going on. But more obviously, I'm afraid, um, is that were the cable historians who wrote the cable books had no engineering experience whatsoever. Um, which is why I found that I could um, go and write my PhD on something because um, no, uh, all the other cable historians, that none of them were engineers and all engineers know 
um, that that nothing is as good as the way it was purported by um, the historians. They did know about um, the fouling of anchors and fishing gear. That's why they moved from Falmouth to uh, Porthcurno. And, and, and they'd heard of underwater earthquakes and volcanoes. But in fact, um, there were far, far more problems. Uh, defective manufacture, improper storage, um, because if you left gutter pressure in the sun, it heated up and the um, copper became eccentric. Uh, insufficient surveying, which I've already mentioned, chafing due to sea currents, um, fish bites, uh, lightning strikes at the cable ends, lack of slack, slack which I've already mentioned, and mal malvevolence. Um, some of the cable ships, um, you know, damage was actually deliberately done by people um, because they always seem to do that sort of thing. But as I, I mentioned earlier on, the, the, the um, there was a copper or brass tape wound round the inner core and this was to stop submarine boring animals which um, uh, was a far worse problem when they were using uh, gutta percha than it was after the 1930s when of course uh, they started using polymers and things um, instead of natural products as insulators. The worst of the lot was this thing called the Tirada Navalis, often known as the shipworm because it's the thing that ate the bottom out of uh, ships, wooden ships. Um, it also got co called a cable borer. Um, it, it, was, it wasn't in fact a worm, it was um, a, mo a mollusk with nasty teeth. Um, it was also called Tamilok. Um, when it was, uh, well, I show us about the size of it. Uh, they called it tamalok in Indonesia um, and ate it um, after deep frying it. But when I started looking at this, uh, somebody gave me a copy of a book called Cable Ships and Submarine Cables uh, by another very good anorak, <laughs> because that's what it is. It's mainly a list of all submarine ships that there are. And I looked at this and I thought, well, this is a bit strange. There seems to be one ship for every cable that's ever been laid. Um, so I started looking for more evidence um, after seeing his book. And um, I went through all the minute books of the board meetings of the ETC. I looked at textbooks on maintenance of which there were a lot, which none of this had been seen uh, by the cable historians. Uh, that's just a, a list of the books that were available from 1868 onwards. Um, so, you know, who was reading these? Uh, obviously not the historians. So when I had gone through all this evidence, um, I found that the story was completely different and there was one repair voyage per annum per 500 nautical miles of cable, of submarine cable, um, and that uh, carried on at that sort of rate from the 1860s to the Second World War, uh, to the First World War, um, and probably farther beyond. Uh, well, my research ended, I stopped at the um, First World War. And then, of course, um, along came Marconi. Uh, this is a picture of um, the Lizard Wireless Station that I took. Um, well, it was 15 years ago now, um, uh, now, which is now owned by the National Trust. Um, and it's actually on the edge. I'm nearly falling off the edge of the cliff taking a picture like that. They were old plate layers huts. And he put the lizard station there, um, the lizard wireless station there for two reasons. One was to um, see what um, the effects of um, Poldu, his main station, um, which was about seven or eight miles away, what effect it would have on other st other ships, uh, on other uh, radio stations. And also, um, this was one of the first coastal radio stations, um, which uh, Marconi was uh, making a lot of money out of at the time. Just eight miles around the coast, and that's, uh, the, that's now an old people's care home. Um, it was a hotel and the cable, uh, the um, Marconi station um, was erected uh, just behind there. 
you'd have thought that Marconi would stay in the hotel, but he didn't. He stays in a hotel around the corner here somewhere, um, which which is it's when you go into the hotel there, it's as though Marconi had never left. This is the um, literally drawn on the back of an envelope, um, the the transmitter at Poldu, um, which was basically was very simple um, and straightforward was probably turning out about up to 10 kilowatts. Uh, when the, uh, these are the spark gaps here, he had two sets of spark gaps, one following the other. And when uh, Morse code was being sent from that, you, apparently you could hear it about a quarter of a mile away. Now there's a lot of argument um, about, well, some people don't know, but more and more technical people are arguing about what actually happened on the 12th of December. 1901. It was daytime. Um, the antenna was 130 meters kite supported vertical untuned receiver. Um, he was, uh, Marconi was using headphones. He was, he knew the time the signal was going to come and knew what it was going to be. So whether, and it was just a coherence he used, whether or not he actually heard anything, nobody could witness it. It was very subjective. The coherer, he tried two types of coherer, uh, the Italian one up here, um, which was more like, uh, which had mercury in it and was more possibly like a semiconductor diode, um, or the, the, the other one which was invented by Branley and others, um, which had iron filings inside it. But the, iron, the trouble with this one was that every time you picked up a signal, you had to give it a tap to undo the, um, on filings. So um, the different a couple of months later in February 1902, um, he did, actually did pick up signals um, while he was on the SS Philadelphia uh, crossing the Atlantic up to um, 1120 kilometers in the daytime, uh, longer at night time. It was a horizontal aerial, a tuned receiver, a coherer again, uh, but he was using a Morse writer. Um, which is a sort of very crude siphon recorder, um, <clears throat> which actually just uses a pen um, to bash onto to the paper. The electrical press um, igno virtually ignored it at the time, um, but the reason for that was um, that both the electrician and the electrical review were very, very associated uh, with, the, with um, the cable industry and obviously thought they were going to lose a lot of business. During the Great War, there were wireless stations um, situated round um, the coast of Cornwall, uh, mainly involved in looking uh, at um, signals, uh, for, um, signals and controlling the, the planes going to uh, sink uh, submarines. After the Great War, Lots more cables were added, and um, at, at the Cornwall area, and this is this lot alone uh, were the ones connected to Porthcurno. 1927, and at Bodmin, the Empire um, uh, Morse service started, um, and that's the transmitter that was there then. Um, here is uh, the the uh, buildings have gone. Um, the antenna was stretched around like that, um, but the, the main buildings were taken down because uh, this is a dual carriageway. It's going through there, so there's nothing left there at all. Uh, the, uh, another thing it was very famous for was um, the, the Land's End radio station, um, and it, this uh, started at, it was the one at the Lizard, and in, it moved first to up to St. Just and then down to Skewjack here. Um, it became one of the most famous uh, coastal stations in the world, not the, not the high powered one, that was in, that's a Portis head that would actually transmit all over the world, but everybody knew about um, Lands End Radio. World War II, um, this is, look, that's the road going up there, that's the cable station, that's from a postcard. Um, they built, a t cut tunnels, it's, this is this, the, on the left is, on the right is the side of the building. Uh, they cut a tunnel into the uh, granite behind 
100 meters of tunnel um, and put all the instruments in there during the war to protect um, the uh, protect it from bombing. Um, this, the, but they were very worried um, that the the uh, it was going to be invaded by um, Germans up the beach. Uh, this is just looking at the beach, the beautiful countryside. Um, I love the way they were dressed doing these things with his trilby hat and everything. Uh, they laid pipes under the beach um, and I'll just let you, I wish he'd run up there so he can get a bit faster. Uh, but at the top of the hill by the, what is now the Minac Theatre, um, there was a large tank of petroleum. And you'll just, I'll just show you a little bit of them testing this, this affair, um, which certainly did protect um, from, they, they were never invaded, um, but I don't think they'd have liked to have met up with that. Uh, World War II also had a lot of Y stations um, that were listening uh, to uh, transmissions from um, all over the world. Uh, the commonest receiver that was used was the National HRO, of which 10,000 were imported during the First World War. And finally, Goonhilly. Now, there's a, a Marco in the Marconi archive, um, I found a letter from um, Marconi to uh, his chief engineer when he was going to go and do uh, build their station at Poldu, and he said, the letter says, don't for goodness sake, go to Goonhilly, it is marshland. And yet, where did BT build their station? Um, on marsh, in marshland. Unfortunately, um, it was sold by BT in 2014, um, and the visitor center there, which was very good, um, was closed, and they keep promising to uh, start a new one. Uh, up in the northeast, uh, Morwen Stowe, there are some more dishes, and they're owned by GCHQ. And this photo was sent to me by GCHQ. GCHQ. Um, so I shouldn't be arrested for showing you it, but it strikes me that the dishes were probably looking at the same um, satellites as Goon Hilly was transmitting through. So we've got a complete circle round. Um, from optical, copper, wireless, um, satellite, and optical. Satellites um, are now basically just television, navigation, uh, mobile communications, uh, remote data, uh, remote sensing. And the static comms have all now gone to uh, fiber optics, which we don't have time to talk about, um, but they're far more, uh, less delectable uh, to the wild animals, but GCHQ have a little bit of a problem. They can't tap them. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was uh, a wonderful tour of um, the history of um, copper back to copper and optical along the way. Optical to optical and copper on the way. Yes. <laughs> yes, a, a circuit. Uh, and, and I wonder where we'll go to next. Um, interesting. Uh, I, I know that uh, BT are making an awful lot of money at the moment from taking copper out of the ground. Um, so we can have it in mobile phones and, and all sorts of other things yep. that we now um, use on a daily basis. So it, it's good to have that recycled circuit from yes. uh, from end to end. Yes. They have tried recycling um, copper from cables in the ocean, but um, it's very expensive to do. And also you're at risk of damaging uh, other cables which are crisscrossing over the top of it.
so I think uh, we're just about ready to to move into some questions and answers if you're um, up for that John yep sure um, so I think uh, Michael has our first question uh, let's bring Michael onto the stage and uh, also with Michael today is uh, Richard he's also uh, helping out and uh, asking your questions. If you have any other questions that you haven't already asked, then uh, do please um, put them in the Zoom Q&A and there's still time to get those in. So are, are you ready with the first killer question, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, hi. Uh, so the first question is for, from Charles, uh, who's asked about um, repeater stations, so on, on land-based uh, systems, um, automatic repeater stations were required every few hundred miles or so, um, whereas underwater, we talk about you know, thousands of miles over, over across the, the Atlantic. How did they deal with um, the similar sort of signal regeneration? Um, it, I've only done my research uh, was up until um, the the first till the Great War. Historians don't call it the First World War; they call it Great War. Um, there were no um, you didn't need to have repeaters for tele these telegraph cables. Um, they didn't the repeaters didn't come around until the beginning of um, reliable thermionics. Um, and so you could, because it's um, obviously the frequency is very, very low, um, telegraphy, um, there was no need for repeaters. And that's why they had to have these very sensitive things like the siphon recorder, uh, because you were looking at a signal which is only a milliamp or so once it across the Atlantic. But there were no, no repeaters in that, that era at all. If there was a if there going to be a repeater, um, it had to be on land, and that's what happened. Uh, for example, the, the cables from um, the UK to India, which was our most, you know, when the, when the empire was at its peak, um, that was the, the more important thing than the Atlantic cables. And there, there were repeaters. Um, they, they come from the, from Porth Kono uh, down to Gibraltar. Gibraltar to Malta, down, then down the Red Sea. But they were the repeaters were all on land, and they um, initially until about the 1930s, um, the, they had to actually write down what they were receiving and retransmit it. Um, it wasn't until the 1930s that they developed a thing called regeneration, which um, took a really rotten little signal like you saw those long distance signals were and completely gener regenerated it from scratch um the the equipment was was incredible really because a lot of this was uh, not thermionic it really wasn't um much later of course uh, there were a lot of thermionics in in the regeneration but the, it was electromechanical the first regenerators and there, um, then you only needed a technician uh, or an engineer to keep the thing, the regenerator running and recalibrating um, every so often during the day. Um, <clears throat> and you, therefore you could have far fewer operators and more engineers. But they were always on land in that era. You, you showed um, some some pictures there of um, the beach at uh, Porth Kerno and uh, and I showed one of the, the height of summer and and so on. Now I, I just found while we were talking that this this one from um, a few days ago um, down at the the Lizard Point by yeah. the um, the lifeboat station. Now, it, it strikes me that um, these cables had to endure all sorts of. Uh, extremes of, of weather as well as people trying to, to drag them up unnecessarily. So uh, what, what about things like shrinkage of the cables and, uh, and that kind of thing, those other environmental things that perhaps wouldn't be significant on a, uh, on, on a piece of cable we might have touched ourselves, but on those sorts of lengths? Right. Um, I haven't got time to go into that, but um, I've got a piece of cable here. I don't, you can probably see it against the size of my hand. Hmm. 
Um, it's about two inches in diameter. And I think you, yes, you, the shiny bits around here, the steel or iron wires, and right in the middle, that tiny little bit in the middle is the core, uh, which is copper surrounded by gutta persia. Now this piece of cable, um, obviously the brass rings are only to, for display. Um, this is massive. Um, and this would be known as a, a shore end because there is much more damage to cables um, from um, not only from ships and fishing gear, uh, but also the, uh, the movement of the ocean uh, would chafe the cable on the rocks or whatever. Once you got out to the deep sea, um, the, there's no current at the, ground, at, the, uh, at the sea bottom. There's no current at all. So, and there's nothing going to damage it. So it will be less than half this size. The core in the middle would be the same, but the layers outside it uh, would be much smaller. So there were, they use about three different types of cable uh, getting smaller and smaller and smaller as it got deeper and then get building up again up the other side. Um, but to talk about uh, how they felt, how they repaired them, um, and how they even found the faults to within a couple of nautical miles. That's another talk on its own. <laughs> and pre presumably the same, the, the same constraints and the same countermeasures would apply if it was an optical cable uh, as, as much as it was a copper. Yes, yes. The cable, um, uh, fibre optic cable is cheaper to produce than this, uh, but it was, um, they, they were, much this this was much i don't know they were probably about the same sort of strength um mechanical strength but the fiber optic ones were always smaller and they would they get damaged just as much and um richard i think you have the next question Yes, uh, thanks, Nigel. Got a question here from Simon Watts. Uh, good evening, Simon. It's a nice, of you, nice of you joining us. Sorry, a bit of uh, uh, declaring interest here. Simon was a former boss of mine, so it's really great to uh, to see him <laughs> to see him uh, on the talk tonight. Thank you. Um, so, a question from Simon is um, another good one. How do they ensure a good earth connection uh, through the sea? Um, they did, to a certain extent, use the 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 iron that was round the iron cores right, that there were the armoring. But the sea is a very good uh, conductor of electricity. And so they just had um, large mats um, at the shore ends. And that, that was the main connection that they had. Right, thank you. Michael. Yeah, um, so going to slightly away very temporarily from the the technology um the question a question being asked here about who actually paid for what must have been incredibly expensive cables so nowadays the fiber cables laid will often be a um you know collaboration between the googles and the amazons of this world back in the the 19th century was it a government enterprise were, or were companies involved in in funding those it was entirely private or, or public companies. The government um, at one stage uh, were going to um, try and put money into it um, or w wanted to put money into it, uh, but they decided it was much better to leave it to the private companies to sort it out for themselves. And they did all the BTs of the, or GPO as it was, um, they did all the inland stuff, but anything that was submarine, um, the biggest company was called Eastern Telegraph Company, um, which had a number of subsidiaries and ended up, of course, as being Cable and Wireless, the company called Cable and Wireless. Um, the money for the um, transatlantic cable, a lot of it came um, from a chap called, uh, or was arranged by a chap called John Pender, Lord Pender, often called the King of the Cables. Um, he was a cotton magnate. And he wanted, he poured money into it because um, he could then get, they could get the price of, of cotton uh, quickly transmitted around the world. And they, they, made, a, they made a lot of money out of, out of that. Um, the the, the uh, 
anybody could use the cables, but they had to pay by the by the letter. And of course, then there was a, the the racket of people who wrote um, code books. Uh, Bentley's is one of them, um, where you had just four digits, uh, mean, meaning a whole sentence, and that sort of thing. All that sort of thing went on. Um, but yeah, most of the, the money all came from private use. There was a chap called Field, Cyrus Field in America, who raised a lot of money there for the transatlantic cable and John Pender at this end. Um, and it was private. The whole thing was done by private. And, and was it profitable for them or was it just a, a yeah, benefit? Yes, very profitable um, because all of a sudden, um, you see, uh, what, what they always mentioned Trafalgar, the Battle of Trafalgar. It took a couple of weeks to get the information uh, about the Battle of Trafalgar back to the UK. Um, it would have taken two minutes by cable, it, 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 depending how far it was, um, because obviously you, the signal slowed down the longer it was, or it might have to go through a series of cable stations that were acting as repeaters. But all of a sudden, there was instantaneous, in inverted commas, uh, transmission of data and, and messages, signals. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard? Yeah, uh, well, something that's puzzled me um, often. I've seen some documentaries on how they do it uh, t today, but uh, certainly in the early days of uh, transatlantic cables, when they've half finished it, how do they find uh, the, uh, the end of the, the half finished cable? That's a question from, uh, from Alex Wood. I'm I was absolutely amazed at how accurate navigation was it, in those days. It's astounding. Um, when they plot, when they um, lay the cables, uh, in those days, um, the uh, Eastern Telegraph Company, the biggest of the companies, and Telcon, which was a subsidiary of them, um, they actually even had to draw their own passage maps. The, the charts of the world were always coastal charts. Um, fine, you know, because you're not likely to hit anything um, if you're going across the Atlantic in the middle. And so there weren't any charts of the mid-ocean at all. And so they had to do their own surveys. Um, and when they laid, the surveys were done by a dangling a wire with a lead weight at the bottom, you know, a really old fashioned way of doing things. Um, they plotted the, the charts and then they, just by using um, uh, longitude, latitude and the, um, what's the word? Um, the sun and the moon and the, uh, can't remember the word. Yes. Sextant. You know, Sextant. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Just by doing that, they got amazing accuracy. And what happened was that they, as they laid the, the cable, just by using a sextant and a chronometer, um, they would be able to plot exactly where they laid the cable on the master chart. And as they um, joined bits of cable together, as they laid it, they would measure the resistance, the electrical resistance in both in both directions, um, and plot that on the chart as well. And the accuracy absolutely astounded me because there was a, um, a cable fault um, which was between um, St Vincent and Pernambuco, or Recife as it's now called. It was a, a hell of a long stretch, and somewhere in the middle it broke due to um, it was probably a, um, a landslide that broke it. When they went to repair it, just by measuring the resistances from each end, they found it within four nautical miles. And then they grappled it and pulled it up and found the fault. But that was quite amazing, really, because that stretch was, uh, it was about 12,000 nautical, uh, 1,200 nautical miles. And yet, bang in the middle of it, they were only four nautical miles out. And they, what they did was they grappled for it and pull it up and then if they hadn't if, if when they pulled it up it hadn't there was no break then they would cut it measure the resistances again both ways to detect where the fault was repair it and drop it down under the ocean again very very skilled very skilled amazing stuff thank you
Um, I guess we've got a couple of questions on a, a sort of related point uh, around basically encoding. So with words per minute being um, incredibly low uh, in the early days, yep. are there standards for encoding to improve the density of information transfer? And also on a, on a slightly other way of encoding, was there any um, encryption ever uh, ever performed on on information before it was sent across yes there was um, especially in um, in wartime there was there was a lot of encryption going on I mean the most famous uh, one uh, story about cr cr um, encryption was is probably Zimmerman telegram um, in about uh, 1913 or uh, no 19. 1916, I think it was, um, Zimmermann, who was the um, uh, foreign minister in Germany, um, sent a telegram, uh, which was in code, uh, to the Mexican ambassador, well, actually via the American ambassador for Mexico uh, in, in America. And we cut all the cables um, during the First World War, day one cut all the cables carefully to make sure that, that we knew what was going on. The one big thing was every, the um, Germans then had to start using wireless far more. And of course that was easier to, to, um, to catch, to get hold of their signals. But anyway, what the Germans didn't realize at the time was that the one that they sent the signal via Sweden across the Atlantic um, to uh, their um, minister in uh, diplomat in New York, which said um, that uh, it had to go down to, then down to Mexico, offering Mexico the deal that if they joined in in the First World War, um, they would make sure that if, if they won, that um, Mexico would get back Texas and another couple of states, which apparently they stole. It's all, there are lots of books written about this Zimmerman telegram. But what they didn't realize was that the, the, the cable went up to Sweden, across to the British Isles, <laughs> down through the British Isles, and out across the Atlantic. And of course, we copied everything that was going down this cable. And we had, um, it was in, um, it was called Baker Street, I think Room 40 in Baker Street, which was the equivalent of Bletchley Park in the First World War and detected all this. And that, that was the, the story was that uh, because we detected it, we told the Americans what was going to happen. And so they came in with us on the first world, in the First World War. But otherwise, um, there were books of cable code um, that were used to make it cheaper to send messages, yes. But there, there, there's the encryption for war and spying, and there's the encryption for, for um, money. <laughs> Thank you. That's... So were, were there, um, if you like, competitors to, um, to the cables that were coming via Cornwall um, from, from other countries, routes that were, were made across uh, the Atlantic or, or elsewhere in the world uh, in, in competition? Um, not really. We had the whole thing sewn up the Brits did for a long time. Mm. The, by the, in the First World War and the Second World War, the Germans did have a cable of their own which went via the Azores and across to the States. But we soon chopped that. <laughs> so, um, but most, most of the cables in the world and most of the cable companies in the world before the First World War were all tied up with what is now, was now cable and wireless. Um, the Eastern Telegraph Company really had it sewn up. Wow. Except for the Atlantic Cables. The Atlantic Cables came under, the, that was a company on its own. But um, even so, John Pender, um, the cotton magnate, um, had a finger in both pies. <laughs> Richard? Yeah, we've got a question here, or, or a comment and a question here from uh, Charles Sperry. So you mentioned in your talk, John, that uh, with the advent of wireless, 
publications at the time didn't report on this development as they had mm. a vested interest in the telegraph business. So plus are changed there as, as far as technology developments are concerned. Anyway, uh, was it wireless or the telephone that actually sounded the end of the telegraph system? What across the, uh, are we talking about across the Atlantic? Yes. Um, they were worried that it would be, that the, they were very worried, the cable companies, um, that uh, it would be the um, wireless which would do them out of try, uh, do them out of thing. There was no, there were, they there was no long distance uh, telephone system at all. Um, and when it when it did start to come again, it was the cable companies who had it tied up anyway. So it didn't do them any harm. What they were were, were really worried about was if people stop using the cables for whatever because of the wireless. Yeah, Charles finishes with a little note that uh, to, to say that uh, modern systems are, of course, once again, digital. So we've kind of come full circle as far as yeah. that's concerned. Yes, yes, that's absolutely true, yes. And it's so cheap now to, to, to phone the states. <laughs> um, sorry. Should I pick one up? Um, we, we've got a question here again, again, a bit less technical, more how this actually worked practically. So Cornwall and a lot of the areas where these systems were is, is fairly remote. Um, where did they get the engineers and operators, some of whom must have been, you know, really technical people to be able to, to operate these systems? Is there a Cornish community of highly skilled um, telegram operators and engineers, or did they come in from, from afar? They, um, the Eastern Telegraph Company had a big building in London, um, which uh, was, the, the, for example, the cable data and stuff coming down the coming to the cables at Porth Cono will be telegraphed to London where it went off to all the to the various places. There was a training school at um, this big I think it was called Electra House I can't remember now but it's right in the middle of London and it was huge but they'd be once they'd been gone through this training school there they would be sent down to Porth Cono um, to be to get some practice in before they were then sent out to the cable stations all over the world. Because the cable stations, um, certainly when they were in the first, with the first 50 years, they were all run by expats from, from the UK. And they'd all been trained in London, gone down to Porth Kerno to be finished um, for work abroad and then sent abroad. Um, the a lot of those buildings that I showed you, the, the white buildings, were where they housed the, not only the operators but also the trainees uh, who were coming down. They weren't local Cornwall people. Cornwall people um, obviously uh, provided a lot of the infrastructure, um, and in bad winters, which they really did have, Cornwall, the Porth Corner could actually get cut off. Um, and on one occasion, um, the uh, there was a cable cut between um, the, the the landline between Penzance, I think it was, and Porthcone itself was downed, um, and they let there was some and there was snow everywhere and all the rest of it. The roads were all blocked, and so the chaps who were who were from Porthcone, trapped in Penzance, um, sent, found it easier to send a cable via Gibraltar. To Paul Kerno to say, help, we're stuck, and this is why we haven't got back yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, that sort of thing could happen. Okay, thank you, uh, Richard. Yeah, great. You've got Go one on last one, haven't you, Richard? Yes, and a question from Andrew Kelleher. Um, I know the, the talk tonight, uh, John, was focused on uh, Cornwall's uh, role in, uh, in, yeah. in transatlantic comms. Um, where in, the in, in your sort of overall history does the Marconi station in County Mayo fit into the overall timeline of your history? I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> um, I didn't specialise uh, really in... Um, in Marconi at all, only the bits that were in, where yeah. he was in Cornwall. So I honestly don't know. Yeah, no, okay. I didn't expect you to. Thank you. Thank you very anyway. much. <laughs>
We've had some lovely comments through uh, from people who uh, enjoyed the, the talk and, and also the views of Cornwall. Um, not, not all snowy as, as we saw a few minutes ago. Um, surprisingly, even snow reaches, uh, reaches to Cornwall. So uh, you're joining us today from uh, in the Midlands. Are you um, snowed in today or um, no. wet like everyone else? I actually like the snow. It brings a child out in me. We've had a little bit, but no, it's it's actually been the temperature since Sunday has been about twelve, which uh, was amazing, really. It's quite unusual for Cornwall to be um, to be very stuck. unusual. Uh, they they specialise in storms down there, <laughs> but it's very rare do they get snow. There was one. There was one time when I was. Uh, due to go down there and they phoned up about it was about six years ago now um, and said don't bother to come for a few days because the I used to stay in Penzance and there's a very steep hill um, that goes down from the A30 down to the valley in Porthcurno and it was just like a slide um, you know children's slide you couldn't the, they were cut off basically um, but uh, it's very rare they get snow down there now. So the the, the other buildings that you um, you showed us, they they were the uh, effectively self-contained accommodation for all the people that were working there. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, it's like, like going on a holiday camp, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, some of the, the some of the buildings are very nice. The and the mess um, is a quite a large pub now. Um, it was in it's the other side of the road, uh, directly opposite the cable station. And it's called the cable station, the pub is. <laughs> I think that's a good point to, to round off on the questions and answers. I, I think we've covered pretty much everything that uh, you, you all um, submitted. Uh, apologies if, if um, Michael and Richard didn't ask your question precisely in your own words, but uh, we try to group together questions on a, a, a similar topic or theme and uh, I hope we've covered at least everything that uh, people were interested in. And um, apart from that last question, which is a little bit unfair, I think we, um, John has really excelled himself both in uh, giving us his, the benefits of his knowledge and also allowing us to, uh, to all pick his brains collectively on the, the topic today. And uh, really, it just remains for me to, to thank John very much for taking the trouble to come along and uh, uh, give us the benefit of his wisdom. So on behalf of everyone who's uh, watching uh, remotely, uh, it's, a, it's a big thank you to John on, uh, uh, on their behalf. Thank you. And that pretty much wraps up our event for today. So thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.